afterwards. There we go. Got the got the recording going. Excellent. So um, I'm really, really excited to to be able to collaborate with Lisa tonight. And I'm going to um, just before we get started, I'm just going to get up the right presentation because right now I don't have the right presentation up. Give me one sec. And let's get going. Sorry. There we go. There we are. Right. So without further ado, let's get started tonight. We are going to be talking all about that magical sense of proprioception, um, which is the most incredible sense in the human body. And before we get started on it, um, I would really love for Lise first to introduce herself. So um, let everybody know who you are, Lise, and what you do. I'm sure most people do know, but introduce yourself. Thank you. So uh, for those that uh, do know me and are followers of mine, hi. Um, and for those that don't, my name is Lisa Valley and I'm a fitness and wellness expert. I've been in the game for, I'd say, oh gosh, 20 years or so, giving away my age. But I've studied things like exercise science and behavioral kinesiology, a bit of nutrition, life coaching, DNA. Um, and I have a real affinity for, for kids and special needs as well, special requirements, um, demographics, uh, like really, really overweight clients, uh, clients with major um, sort of health issues and, and also children, pregnancy, post-pregnancy. And I've been in the industry for a long time in the wellness side of things. So not just fitness, I love fitness, but uh, way more around looking at somebody's holistic well-being and helping them on all spheres. So changing mindset, looking at uh, personality, sort of behaviors and trying to change those behaviors, nutrition, DNA, supplementation, uh, sleep, digestive disorders, stress management. I love to look at the person and say, right, how do we, how do we fix you for good? Not just a 12 week sort of makeover, but how do we actually get you there and forever so that it's lifelong habits that I'm teaching you. I love teaching people how to fish when it comes to their, to their health. And I'm a huge rebounding fan. So about five years ago, I started uh, rebounding and I started a rebounding business, which we named Bounty. And I have been practicing that every day, shooting beautiful content and launching rebounding products in South Africa and soon to be globally. And uh, about two years ago, I started working on a kiddies program called Bounty Kids, which we are going to talk to you a bit about tonight. Um, and yeah, I just want to I want to share all of that with with all of you, because it's something that I have uh, really seen great success success with uh, with lots of our parents, kiddies and teachers and schools. And yeah, it's just been such an amazing journey. And I can't wait to impart some of that knowledge onto you. So yes, I'm in wellness, fitness, health, uh, but more than anything, I just love to empower people to to own their health, educate, um, and just to make it as easy, as affordable, as fun, as lifelong as, as possible. So yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Wonderful, Lisa. And you're going to be back just now after I've been speaking a bit about proprioception to just really um, help us to understand how to put this into our children's lives. Yeah. Um, so welcome from my side as well. I'm Meg Four, the co-founder of PlaySense. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am an occupational therapist, which is why I am so passionate about proprioception, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, I'm the author of eight books, including Baby Sense and Weaning Sense. And um, I'm really, really passionate about helping parents and little ones achieve their optimal uh, function in life. And um, that early relationship of a mom and a baby for me and, and a dad is really, really central to all the work that I do. So sometimes I'm working with preggy moms and sometimes I'm working with moms of little babies. Um, but in this case tonight, I'm really talking to you with my uh, place sense hat on. My place sense hat is all around early childhood development. So we're going to be speaking about ECD, early childhood development tonight, and the role that proprioception plays in that. So before we get started, I want to let you know who is in the audience. So I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. So a little bit about who's here today. So you can see by far the majority of you, 57% um, um, have little ones over four years old. Um, my child, this is your child, um, has good coordination and balance, is sometimes a little clumsy, likes to rough play, and is still too little to determine. So most of you have got little ones who've got good balance and coordination, which is awesome. Um, most of you, 50% thinks that your little one may get enough movement in their day, um, which is awesome. 40% think that they may not. Um, and how often does your little one engage in movement play? Um, most of you say we play as a family every day, which is so awesome because that's what it's all about is, is playful families. 
So thank you for filling that out. Um, so I'm going to get started. I'm going to tell you a little bit about proprioception. If you've got any questions tonight, just pop it in the chat below or in the Q&A. We'll be monitoring both of it, those. The way that tonight is going to work is I'm going to talk for a very short amount of time on the science. Um, and so let's just quickly just um, pop across to the slide of Lisa and I. There we go, Lisa. There you and I. There you are on your rebounder. For those of you who don't know what a rebounder is, there you go. That beautiful piece of equipment down there. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about the science now. And immediately after that, I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who's going to talk a little bit about how do we actually do this with our children? How do we get our children moving in the way that actually creates this kind of brain explosion? And then, Lisa, you're going to be drawing the most amazing um, hamper. Well, how much is it worth tonight? Oh, gosh. We didn't do the, the total cult, but it's one human being winning about eight prizes. And it's definitely over 10,000 rand. It's incredible, absolutely incredible, including the Fitbit. And Lisa, if somebody's in the audience, the person who wins this, what do they get? So if you're in the audience, uh, we, uh, we try to get, obviously, people that had entered the competition to listen to the amazing information. Uh, you will get an additional e-store voucher for 500 Rand. Yeah, so wow. if you are the winner tonight and you're in the audience, you get the additional um, voucher. If you're not, sorry. Okay, awesome. So there you go. But they still do win if they're not in the audience, but hopefully yeah. the person is in the audience because we want to give away a whole lot tonight. Um, and then through the course of the evening, we'll pause and we'll answer your questions as well. So let's get started and talk a little bit about the science of proprioception. So a little bit about my background. Immediately after graduating from UCT, I went to go and live in New York. And while living there, I embarked on a journey of learning about sensory integration. And sensory integration is basically how the human brain takes in sensory information, integrates it and processes it in an area of the brain called the thalamus, and then is able to do things in the world. And um, when I started to learn about sensory integration, it just completely blew me away because for the first time, I really understood how little ones learn and how we can really affect learning and development. And in fact, weaning sleep, all aspects of development for little ones, just by watching those, those weaning, um, the way in which um, little ones take in sensory information. So uh, we know that the senses are critically important. Um, now, if I had to say to you tonight, which is the most important sense, or maybe I should say to you, if there was one sense that you were really going to miss, if you lost it, what would it be? Um, and you can actually pop it down in the chat below, because most of you will be able to try and imagine yourself either as being um, um, hard of hearing or of being blind or potentially um, not having um, tactile sensation. So there could be a multitude of, of, of pieces of sensory information you could lose. And let's have a look at what most of you would say. So many of you say if you lost your sense of sight, that would be the most devastating thing. And, and I agree that, you know, not being able to see would be absolutely devastating. And other people, our hearts, our answers, um, if I was, if I had lost my sense of balance. So that's actually what we're going to be talking about tonight. Part of it is balance. And that's in the vestibular system. So, of course, we all have these ideas of um, what it would be. Um, some of you have said the sense of touch, which, of course, and some of you have said vestibular. So we've got some awesome um, responses coming through. And so um, we've all had this, got this different take on if we lost one sense, what would it feel like? But as I looked into sensory integration, I started to work out that there was a sense that it was actually the sense that would create the most loss. And it's not the sense of sight or vision or even touch. It's a sense of proprioception. So what is proprioception? Because this, um, if I'm telling you it's so important, why is it that most of us don't even really know about it? And it's not something that's spoken about. When you learned about the five senses at school, it wasn't even, the list, even in the list of five senses. So proprioception is an incredibly important sense. Um, it's actually a sense that comes from the muscles and joints. So this yellow um, label over here, um, it's involved in the stretch receptors, um, which are in the skin, um, in the joints, and in the muscles. And so these stretch receptors or Golgi tendon organs and, and the um, different tendon organs and muscles, spindles, actually send information back up to our brain in every given moment. So just as you're sitting there now, your sense of proprioception is working really hard. And if you close your eyes and you put your body into a certain position, you know exactly what position your body is in, simply because you're getting feedback from this incredible sense, the sense of proprioception. And so the sense of proprioception, which comes from all of these yellow dots, moves up the spinal cord, up the spinal column, and lands up in the brain. And in the brain, we have this, um, th this, this area of the brain called the thalamus, and the thalamus is, was otherwise known as the relay station. And so the relay station takes all the information from the sense of proprioception and combines it with our visual information and also with our vestibular organs. So that's our balance, balance um, contro uh, control. That's in the inner ear, and it tells us about whether or not we're upside down or the right way up. 
And so this thalamus, this part of the brain takes all this information in and it feeds it through into an awareness of where our body is in space. But it does a whole lot of other really, really magical things, really important things. So one of the important things that proprioception does is it develops our child's focus and attention. And that is one of the reasons why when children sit very still for a long period of time, or when they are lazing back on a couch, just watching television as an example, we've all seen it, their muscle tone starts to go lower and their arousal levels or their focus and their concentration actually goes lower as well. And so they start to go kind of into that kind of catatonic state, which of course, when you've got a busy two-year-old is actually like sometimes that's a bit of relief. Um, but the reality is that actually the brain is kind of going into a really um, low level of arousal and a low state. And so it's not an optimal state for focus and attention. And that's one of the reasons why um, when people talk about ADHD or ADD, so that attention deficit, dis dis attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity or without hyperactivity, one of the things that we know about those children is that they are incredibly busy. And the reason why the ADHD kids are incredibly busy is because their bodies and their brains intuitively know that if I take in extra sensory information through the sense of proprioception, I can get my arousal levels back up again or my concentration levels back up again, and I can actually focus. So when people talk about little kids having ADHD, we don't like those labels. I am uh, um, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm quite averse to children being labeled too early with something like that. And I think actually it's part of the nature of who children are that they actually really need to move and they need to move so that they can achieve that focus and attention. So the sense of proprioception, firstly, when we're talking about its importance, is really, really important in terms of focus and attention. So if anybody is starting to label your child as having ADD, even if they're in a primary school age, you need to go back and have a look at how much proprioception is going on, how much is actually going on in terms of movement in their day, because that can have a direct impact on their attention levels. In addition to that, it also has an impact on mood. And um, I'm sure that many of you have seen what happens to your child when they're sitting in front of TV for too long and then you turn it off. They're really ratty. Have you seen that? That they actually get really crotchety and irritable and, and they're actually just a pain. And there's whining and there's drama. And what's gone on is that their mood is slumped and slumped and slumped as they've sat for longer and longer in front of the TV. And the reason for that is that our sense of proprioception is an incredibly important regulator of mood. And so when little ones are feeling wired, are feeling irritable, are feeling tense, one of the things that we can do is actually give them extra proprioception to help them feel okay again. So proprioception is important for concentration. It is incredibly important for mood. And then the other thing that it's really important for is this feed forward control. So you can see these two um, pink arrows. This arrow says that information comes from our body up to our brain, gets processed in our brain. But at the same time, everything that goes on in our brain comes back down our thermal column and tells our body what to do. So proprioception is actually the sense that does that. And it's the sense that actually links our brain, our sensory system with our motor system. So if you're looking at um, the science between the way, behind the way that the brain works is we've got our sensory neurons that go into the brain and our motor neurons that come out of the brain and the link between the two of those is proprioception. So it's a critically important um, integrating sense. So this is a picture of what we call the homunculus. So the homunculus is an imaginary representation of our body and it happens over here in the brain in the somatosensory cortex. And what happens is as proprioception moves up to the, up to the cortex, it lands up creating a, a, an, an internal schema or the in, an internal representation of, of our body in space. So really what it means is that every brain cell up in these areas of the brain actually code for a certain part of our body. And what's interesting, what's really interesting about that is that it's proprioception that actually decides how much real estate our brain has to dedicate to this in, this in the sensory motor cortex. So here you can see that this person's lips and tongue have a lot of real estate. In other words, a huge amount of the neurons in this space, there you can see them over there for the lips, are actually taken up with the mouth and the lips. Now, the reason for that is that we need to know exactly what's going on in our mouth and our lips in order to articulate language. And the only way that we can articulate language is with good body schema. So this little guy is our body schema. And how do we build that body schema? 
it's through proprioception. So proprioception is the way in which our body takes in the, the, the sensory information to build this man, to build this little homunculus or this little representation in our brain. Um, and it's a, on the basis of that representation that we can actually direct our bodies to do something. So when parts of our body are very important, like for instance, our mouth and our lips, and in fact, our thumb as well, they get a whole lot extra real estate. And that real estate is developed through specifically through the sense of proprioception, also the sense of touch as well. So our somatosensory system is made up of touch and proprioception, but proprioception is very, very important. What's really interesting, which is quite fascinating when you think about the evolution of human beings, is that um, now that we're using our thumbs so much to text, the amount of real estate dedicated to the thumb in the brain is actually growing. And that's because as we move our thumb and as we're moving around, we're actually using our sense of proprioception all the time to tell us exactly where our, our finger's moving. And if you guys are typing a WhatsApp and you hit the wrong letter without looking at the screen, you'll know you've hit the wrong letter because of that incredible sense of proprioception, which is giving your brain the feedback that says um, that this is actually where, where I've hit, what, which button I've hit. So you haven't even seen it on your screen, but you know it because of the way that your thumb works, because of the way your proprioception works. So proprioception is a magical sense. Without it, we will feel low. Without it, we will be uncoordinated because if we don't have a sense of our body in space, we will not know how to coordinate it. So as an example, if you are standing or if your child is standing and you roll a ball towards them and you want them to kick it, they have to have a body schema in their brain of where their foot is in space. So my foot is at the end of my leg. And right now, majority of my weight is on my left foot. And therefore, I can swing my right foot back and swing it towards the ball. That's an example of um, motor planning. And the foundation of motor planning is our body schema. And our body schema is based on proprioception. So you can see that in addition to your mood and your concentration, your ability to coordinate yourself in space is completely linked up with this, this link of proprioception. So proprioception is critically important. So to summarize what I've said here, um, if you look at the outcomes that you're wanting for your child right now, so if, if, if you sit in, and many of you have got children who are over four years old, some of you have got little babies, this over here on the right hand side, these are the things that your child is going to need to do in order to really be able to learn academically, in order to be able to play sport, to be able to play a musical instrument, to be able to read and write, and to be able to function in the world. These are the foundations of it. There's not all the foundations, there's a whole lot more, there's the emotional aspect as well, but I wanted to just break down some of the important things. So in order to be able to write or to be able to play sport, you need to be able to do motor planning. You have to be able to plan that movement, like I was just describing, that, that kicking the ball. You have to be able to plan the movement. You have to be able to coordinate the two sides of your body, which requires muscle tone. So that muscle tone is very, very important that I can actually stand on one foot to lift the other foot and kick that ball. Um, you need balance because balance is pivotal in being able to actually sit on a chair to be able to work academically, but it's also pivotal in being able to, for being able to actually do sport as well as an example. So balance is very important. And then of course your concentration needs to be well developed. If your little one gets to um, grade R and they are not able to concentrate for more than 30 seconds at a time, you're gonna get a letter from the teacher. And so that concentration is a, is a, a neural foundation that, is re that it really forms the basis for learning. So it's very important. And then of course, behavior is also important. So the way in which your child interacts with the world is critically important. And if you have a child who is incredibly difficult um, and is always um, performing, always um, tricky in a social situation, doesn't socialize with other children, always hits other children, bites other children, you can imagine how caught up in, that, in your child's behavior your emotions will be. You'll be so anxious to get into a social situation and have your child who bites, for instance. So these foundations over here, motor planning, coordination, balance, concentration, and behavior are very obviously very important for your child's development in all different areas. So what underlies these? Well, underlying our ability, our ability to plan our, our movements, um, whether it's texting or whether it's writing or whether it's playing golf or underlying our ability to coordinate our body is of course body schema. So that was that little homunculus that I showed you. He is the foundation for that, for the green. So that's where the homunculus sits. The muscle tone is the foundation for balance, for gross motor coordination. Um, it's um, really, really important for equilibrium reactions. It's important for being able to sit on a chair. So that's muscle tone. 
And in your third aspect, that's really, really critically important is, of course, your arousal levels. And when we talk about arousal levels in children, we're talking about how much to zoom your brain has. Is your brain ready and wired for the activity they're about to embark on? So um, as an example, our arousal levels actually fluctuate all day. So if you guys are sitting back on your couch and you're watching this, um, your arousal levels have actually dropped a bit. So your, your concentrations um, and your kind of um, your, your um, kind of your your, your how, how wired your brain is has dropped a little bit and that happens your, as your arousal levels drop and that's appropriate for what we're doing right now but let me tell you that if there was a fire in the next door room or if your child started to scream next door immediately your arousal levels perk up because you've got to be on defense for a flight fright and fight so our arousal levels are supposed to change during the day but they're supposed to line up with what activity we're doing and what often happens with our children's arousal levels is that we need to be able to concentrate in a classroom as an example. And so our arousal levels need to be at peak in order to be able to do that. And in order to get our arousal levels at peak condition, we need a whole lot of movement, which comes from proprioception. And so you can see how this works, that proprioception is the root of just so many things that are actually pre-academic as well as behavioral foundations for your child. So that is why when I say to you, which is the most important sense, you can see why I believe that proprioception really is the most important sense. So things to think about. So um, I don't know how many of you have been faced with a situation like this. I certainly have. Um, my firstborn child um, was a boy. And after that, I used to pray for girls. Thank goodness I got two after that because my boy was busy. He was hectic, least I promise you, he was enough to be a contraceptive. Um, so I will never forget one day that he walked into the kitchen, him and his friend, they'd been quiet for a while and had painted themselves from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet with blackboard paint. And they had somehow found it in the garage and they painted themselves. And of course that took weeks to come off because we couldn't put them in a bath of turps, which is the only way we'd get it off. Now that type of mischief is often construed as naughtiness. And I think what often happens for children and toddlers is that the behaviors that we see are labeled as naughty. And I think what is often happening is that it's not so much the children are being naughty, it's that they're either exploring their world or they're bored, which by the way, I love boredom, I think it's very important, or they actually need a little bit more movement. And that was one of the things I discovered with James is that if he had the more movement he had, the better behaved he was. And those so-called naughty behaviors, which we don't want to label as naughty because a lot of them are actually exploratory behaviors, but a lot of the naughtier behaviors are things that we actually can short circuit with a whole lot of movement. So one of the behaviors that I think none of us would um, debate being naughty is biting. So um, I know that many of you with babies who are toddlers will know that biting comes up. And biting is one of those things where kids are actually going in to get extra proprioception. You'll remember from the homunculus that there's a lot of proprioceptors in your jaws. And so babies who bite are often actually little ones who um, are needing extra proprioception. So the first thing you need to know is that not all behavior that's labeled as naughty is actually naughty. naughty. Some of it is sensory seeking and in particular proprioception. The second thing to remember is that we all are different. And for some of us, we need lower levels of movement. But for some of us, particularly our sensory seekers, they need more proprioception than your average child. And so proprioception and movement is critically important. The third thing that I want you to think about is that, and it's kind of linked up with this fourth thing, is that the amount of technology our children consume in terms of sedentary activities, and this is when you're sitting and vegetating, looking at an iPad or a TV, means that they do not get enough movement and they do not get enough proprioception. And so there's this link between technology and by this, I mean kind of that um, kind of sitting and vegetative um, you know, looking at technology through to a lack of proprioception with a knock on effect into our body schema our, and, and our concentration and then on to our, into our academic abilities. And so we really, really need to be aware of the amount of movement we have in our children's lives. So, um, I'm going to finish off before I hand over to Lisa and I'm going to just tell you that I think that there are a couple of things that your baby should have in fives and one of them is obviously their fried fruit and veg in the day and I threw that in not because it has anything to do with proprioception but because it's common wisdom but I think that there are five other things that you can put in, in in doses of five that can really help your child so the first one is to have a five minute massage after bath and you know massage interestingly is also a form of proprioception so it's not just jumping on a trampoline that gives you fabulous proprioception but it's also giving your little one a massage after bath so that's number number one number two is to make sure your child has at least five sensory experiences every day they must have some visual they must have some wonderful taste experiences they must have a lot of movement and lovely proprioception 
and auditory as well. So you must make sure that their days are laden with fabulous five sensory experiences in a day. When they're watching TV, they're only getting one. So just remember that, and that's visual, okay? Very little other going on for little ones when they're vegetating. The other thing is, and I've had to make it, it's 15, so I've made it five times three, minutes of engagement with absolutely no technology. And what this means is one-on-one -on -one time with you that has no phone either. So no technology for you, no technology for your child. And if you do 15 minutes of that every day, really focused engagement, you're gonna fill up their emotional tank. And then the final five is five minutes of movement for every 30 minutes of still time. Please, if your child has been too still, even if they're, and particularly little ones, even if they've been still doing a puzzle or still doing schoolwork, but particularly if they're still doing technology, make sure that they get up and get those five minutes going in every single half an hour of, of sedentary time. So those are my daily fix of fives. Um, and I really do encourage you to focus in on proprioception because it's a magical sense. It is the gateway for so many areas of development. So I'm gonna come around to your questions afterwards. And at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Lise to be able to tell us her way of getting a whole lot of proprioception into little children's brains. Yay, thanks Meg. You're gonna share, allow me to screen share. Cool, thank you. Um, let me just quickly go here. Where am I going? Sorry, guys, I've got to try and find this now on my desktop. There you go. Well, okay. Okie dokes, there you go. You can all hear me, see me. Can you hear me, Meg? You can hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Alrighty, so I'm so glad that you said the last thing on your five, because <laughs> I was like, yes, that's perfect for rebounding, because I also advocate five minutes. You know, if you get more than five minutes, fantastic, but five minutes is incredible. So for those of you that don't know what rebounding is, rebounding is exercising on a mini trampoline. Because some people, when I say rebounding, they go, huh, what do you mean? Is it like, you mean from like a guy, from a relationship? There's still a lot of people out there that don't actually know what a rebounder is. So just think a little mini trampoline that's portable, that you can utilize, you know, at schools, um, at gymnasiums, gym studios, uh, yoga, Pilates studios, or in your own home. It has changed my life, the, the lives of um, so many of my clients, so many of my clients' children, and of course, my own little girl, Bella Boo. So I thought before I talk a little bit about what is Bounty, what is Bounty Kids, how can we incorporate it into our lives, where do we start, I thought I'd show you a little video, because this is Bella Boo when she was little. How cute is she? And there's a little video here of her. This is her progression from when she was in walking. She was, I think, nine months old at this age. It was the first time that she sat on a rebounder. You can see it's not even a nice bounty rebounder. It's a, um, it's a, it's a kind of like a sample that I was testing at that stage. And here she is on her bum, couldn't even stand. <laughs> Do, do, do. 
Okay, there you go. <laughs> so there was Bella Boo from the time that she was about nine months old until she was about two years old. I'll show you just now what she's capable of doing, but we started her out because obviously we have rebounders around our house all the time. I mean, I have been rebounding now since I was five months postpartum trying to shed all my baby weight because I was really large after I gave birth and I really struggled to lose the weight until I'd stopped breastfeeding. So I use rebounding as a way to bounce back literally after a really, really difficult um, end of my pregnancy and a huge weight gain for somebody that's slight. It was a, a lot of stress in my body. I was very uncomfortable and I wanted to do something that was very low impact on my joints, my ligaments, my tendons, uh, the fact that I'd had a Caesar, my entire pubic bone had split. Um, I was in a lot of pain and I needed to do something that wasn't as, as jarring as pounding of pavement, running, crossfits, you know, hectic stuff. I needed to do something that was very forgiving, um, but that was effective on my time, something that I could do with my little baby sleeping next to me. Uh, because she wouldn't let me leave her side. She never took a bottle or an ounce of formula for 13 months. I breastfed her right up until that point. And so I needed to get fit. And how do you get fit next to a sleeping baby? Well, the best way is to actually rebound um, because I wasn't into sort of running on a treadmill. I couldn't really, and cycling was boring. So I started rebounding because it was out of complete necessity. I also have a huge history with rebounding. Um, I was a gymnast and a ballerina my whole high school, and we used trampolining as a, an amazing way to, to get fit and to kind of like learn our moves when it comes to the big moves, the big somersaults and all the crazy stuff. We practiced them first on a, on a rebound or on a trampoline before we could do them on land to kind of um, perfect those, those intricate moves. So when I was five, eight, 10, I, I was on a, on a trampoline until I had finished school. So when I started rebounding again, it was kind of like my youth was back. Um, I felt weightless and free. I felt like I was having fun. Um, I felt like a child again. So, and that's what a lot of our clients say to us is that I haven't felt so happy exercising ever. Um, and nobody ever feels worse off after doing a, a workout on a trampoline. They feel young again, free again. That weightlessness, that sort of half a, a half a second of weightlessness is a sense of freedom and you feel elevated um, and childlike again, and we have fun. And that is a big factor for me is that it has to be fun. The minute you tell a child that it's time to go for a run or it's time to exercise, Bella goes, you mean extra fries, mom? I'm like, no, exercise. So um, yeah, it's just, it's for, for me, exercise has to tick all the boxes and we'll talk about that now, but a fun factor means it's got a stickiness and if kids enjoy it and it's lots of fun and then you add to that a bit of tech screen, um, you add to that music and movement and you can bring in mom and dad participating, sisters and brothers participating, friends that come on play dates participating. Um, now we have, and I'll show you at the end, our live classes where there's hundreds of little kiddies participating with their screens on. It is awesome because everybody gets involved and everybody has a good time. It's not a mission, it's not a hack, it doesn't feel like a slog. And that is so important when it comes to stickiness for children and keeping them motivated and keeping them um, you know, focused and keeping their attention. So for preschool age kids, now I know that there are a lot of um, sort of older kids and that's good news for all of you because rebounding is good for all ages and stages from nine months all the way to 85 years old. Um, you're never too young, never too old to bounce in a rebounder with modifications, of course. But toddlers and preschool children should be um, active a couple of times in a day. So we like to call them exercise snacks. Um, they lose interest. A lot of little Lees lose interest after, you know, five or six minutes. It's kind of two songs. You've got to do what you can in those two songs and they're off. And then they want to go to something else. But you can always bring them back later for another two songs or an activity on the rebounder. So I call them exercise snacks because they're little nuggets throughout the course of the day that break up sedentary time. Like Meg said, so many kids are, are on Zoom all day. I know Bella's doing homeschooling at the moment. And um, it's, it's tough because you sit her there for half an hour. Now, you know, it's, now she's 
it's, it's hard to, to keep her attention for the half an hour. And now I'm worried about that because she's been sitting for half an hour. So I use a rebounder in between those classes. Um, I say, right, let's go. Let's put a song on. Let's go crazy. And if it's not me, it's her, her or pair or it's her dad or it's her big sisters. And we can have fun for three minutes, get the heart rate up, bounce, cross the midline, uh, do balance work, put on her favorite Katy Perry or pink uh, playlist or whatever it is. And then, you know, we've got all the oxygen to the brain, everything's circulating again. Um, the proprioception boxes have all been ticked and now she's focused and she's ready to sit behind the laptop again for another lesson. So it's really hard to do that with walking around the block or doing some kind of like huge big um, obstacle course around the lounge every single time there's a short break. But having a rebounder with a little Bluetooth speaker is an easy win for everybody. So toddlers should be getting at least 60 minutes of active play a day and preschoolers um, should be getting 120 active minutes every single day. Now, I mean, who really gets that amount of exercise in a day? And this doesn't mean structured exercise. It means five minutes here, um, a pillow fight there, a walk around the block. Um, then it's, you know, soccer practice in the afternoon. Then it's playing on the jungle gym during tea break. So all those five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour all add up to 60 minutes um, and have to actually ideally get to 120 minutes. So when kids are at school, it's pretty easy for them to be getting that amount of active time in. My big concern is when we all went into lockdown last year and now we're all in kind of lockdown again um, and going into school holidays, parents are working from home, they are super busy, a lot of the time stressed, um, and this isn't always happening. So my big concern is now that the world has changed and may be like this for some time, how are our children getting their exercise snacks all the way through the day? Okay. All right, so, you know, all components of physical fitness um, have to be met to make sure that we tick all the boxes. So cardiovascular fitness, we know that is all around strengthening the heart and the lungs and making sure that we bring down our resting heart rates and we strengthen the heart muscle in general. Uh, we all know what cardiovascular fitness is. This is our aerobic um, activity and it's you can kind of get it, um, you know, by running, walking, um, swimming, any kind of cardiovascular exercise will tick this box, okay? But not all exercise ticks all these boxes. And it's important for children to have all of these boxes ticked at the end of every day. Okay, then we have stretching and flexibility. So it's important to have nice, long, lean muscles, not short, um, sort of tense muscles. Uh, long lean muscles give a, a better aesthetic look, number one. Number two, they prevent injuries, uh, which is so important because if your muscle's short um, and you have a very cold morning and a fast uh, move to the left, fast move to the right, um, and your muscle's really, really tense, um, there's a really good chance that you could uh, tear muscle and then create an injury. So it's important to have nice, long, lean muscles. Um, and rebounding uh, definitely ticks those boxes because we do flexibility in every single one of our sessions. Then we have body composition. I know Meg spoke a bit about this, so muscle tone, making sure that our body fat percentage is low, our muscle mass is high, our bone density is high, um, and it's way more important to focus on a child's body composition than it is to, to worry about what a child weighs. Um, it's not just about the weight, it's about how much bone does that child have, what is the ratio of bone to muscle, what is the ratio of fat to, to muscle mass, and how much water is the body storing. That is way more important than the child weighs X, Y, Z. Okay, so body composition is a big one. It's something I focus on a lot with our adult clients um, and kiddies without them even knowing we are measuring their body composition in, in different ways and forms. But uh, making sure that their, their muscle mass is, is as high as possible um, to give them a good metabolism because their metabolism kind of sets them up for the rest of their lives is absolutely critical. Um, then motor skills um, are things like coordination, balance, speed, agility. They're going to need all of those in, in sports um, right throughout their lives. So making sure that that box is ticked. Muscular strength is something a lot of people forget about. Um, you know, kiddies need to be working with their own uh, body weights, you know, push-ups and squats and plyometric jumps and cartwheels and um, crunches and planks and things where they, it's called an isometric hold, where they're holding their own body's weight for a particular length and time. Um, it's really, really important for building muscle and bone and your neurological growth as well. So muscular strength is a really important one. And then muscular endurance. So the, the body's ability to continue to perform this task without getting tired. Um, and this is going to be important for the rest of their 
their lives, you know, keeping their fit, strong, healthy, and if they are specifically wanting to, to excel in any kind of sport. So rebounding, what, what, why is it so, so um, amazing for kids? Because it's like it ticks all of those boxes and in some way or form throughout an entire workout, whether it's a snack or whether it's a full 15 minute or 30 minute class, depending on how, uh, what class your, your child is doing, whether they're a three year old, four to six year old, seven to 11 year old, um, will depend on how much of those different things we, we factor into the class. But number one is that jumping is a natural ch a child behavior. So as soon as a child can walk, the first thing that they want to do is jump. They jump on the couches, they jump on your bed, they jump everywhere. I mean, those trampoline parks are incredibly popular on the weekends. Why? Because children love to jump. So it's a natural behavior. Children love it. They gravitate towards it. They're not going to fight you for, you know, to, to not do it. They are very game. If you say, should we bounce? Put on a song, come, let's bounce. Um, they are going to love it. And that is the stickiness that you're going to need. Okay, then cardiovascular health, we've kind of mentioned, but rebounding is amazing for your heart. It's, uh, it burns a lot of calories in a short space of time, so it's very time efficient, very effective. Um, two minutes of rebounding is equivalent to six minutes of running. So from a time perspective, it's incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, and let's be honest, we don't always have a lot of time. So if we can do 10 minutes of rebounding, um, and that, that equates to a 30 minute run, I mean, how amazing is that? Um, you know, for, from a time efficiency point of view. So cardiovascular health, it gets your heart rate up, it strengthens the heart muscle, it lowers the heart rate. Um, and that's the whole point is to put less strain on your heart um, over time, you know, so that uh, it improves our, our heart health and reduces um, our sort of cardiovascular disease risk uh, later on in life. Um, strengthens one's immune system. So something that uh, we could, I could talk about for an hour is the importance of the lymphatic system. This is a system that is actually a really big system in our bodies and, and one that is uh, responsible for getting rid of all of our toxins and ridding the body of all of these the sort of unwanted waste. And our lymph system is three times bigger than our bloodstream, our blood system, and yet it's got no pump. The only way that you can actually pump your lymphatic system is through movement and exercise um, and through heavy breathing, deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, and also stimulation with a massage, a proper lymphatic massage, which is painful. Children do not enjoy that type of massage. Um, teaching them how to breathe is a really, really cool tool that you can set them up um, for, you know, set them up with for life, but that is something that they will learn as they get a little bit older. Uh, one of the best ways to stimulate your lymphatic system is through rebounding. Um, that's acceleration and deceleration of the body. Uh, the cells open up um, and, um, and they close after every sort of jump and then bounce onto, onto the rebounding mats, that weightlessness and then that compression opens up the lymphatic system and stimulates uh, the lymph, which helps to detoxify. So it, it's, uh, the toxins actually go through the kidneys and out through the urine. And so lots of water is recommended throughout um, a workout and afterwards. Okay, um, for mental health, we know how important, um, you know, exercise is for all, um, for all kinds of uh, behaviors and mood, mood disorders. Um, but it also is important for releasing those happy hormones um, that we feel that we need to enhance our mood. Um, rebounding is an excellent way for children to unwind. Um, they have to be completely and utterly um, focused during that time. Sorry guys, I have to just let my, my Jack Russell in. Just give me one second. The beauty of a live Zoom. <laughs> We've got to let the Jack Russell in. It's distracting me so much. I don't even know how she managed to get up the stairs. But yeah, anyway, here's uh, Harley. This is my firstborn who also likes rebounding. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, the endorphins are really, really important parts um, of um, of kind of shifting a child's mood, just as, as Meg mentioned with proprioception, that when they have too much screen time, they get moody and irritable. So we know that exercise, the endorphins, those happy hormones are critical. Um, and you can achieve this by any kind of movement, but rebounding definitely does the trick because it is so fun and children really, really enjoy it. So it's a great way to unwind and just forget about your worries and woes. Even if you're five, you've still got your own worries and woes, and it really helps with mental health. Building strong bones is huge. I mean, they did a, um, a couple of studies years and years ago with NASA. So NASA was one of the first institutes to endorse rebounding. 
because it was so good at building bone density and muscle tone with the astronauts that returned back from space after they had been weightless for so long. They are forced to exercise up in space. I mean, I'm sure you've seen all those big contraptions. They're strapped in and they've got to run on the treadmill and they've got to do all these resistance band work. But they still lose a lot of bone density when they're up in space and then um, and muscle mass. So muscle mass and therefore bone density. So they put them on rebounders when they came back um, onto Earth. And they found that their, their muscle mass and bone density um, really increased at a rapid rate. And they did research into this and they proved it. And, and just recently in the last five years, they did another study with gymnasts um, and measured their bone density because of how much they used uh, trampolines in their training and found that, re uh, that gymnasts have that rebound um, had really, really strong bones um, and had really little um, sign of osteopenia, osteoporosis, and all of the brittle bone diseases, um, and really high, obviously, muscle tone. But they, specifically, their bones were so much stronger than the average child their age doing the average amount of exercise per week, and they could bring it down to um, the fact that they were working on a trampoline um, for so many hours in a week. Um, also, their, their bones and their joints um, are being protected. So even though it's a lot of uh, cardiovascular work, it's a lot of, when I say impact, it's low impact. So every time they're landing in a squat, every time they're landing on the rebounder, the muscles are all the little mus muscles, the little ligaments, the little ten tendons are all there to balance a child, are there to um, kind of make sure that they don't sprain their ankles and things. So all of them are being tested and tried um, and they are being challenged. Those tiny muscles and the, the ligaments and ten tendons are being really, really challenged throughout an entire rebounding workout. But what's so important is that it's low impact. So it is good at building bones and increasing um, muscle mass, but it's so low impact. So there's less risk of developing uh, wear and tear and injuries and fractures and sprains and things like that. So they um, their little bones and that are being cushioned, but at the same time, the muscle mass is being um, challenged and with that comes increased bone density. Improves posture and builds core strength because of that proprioception, your body kind of understanding where it is in space and time. Um, you know, you, a lot of it is one, one legged work, jumping on one leg, moving to the other leg, balancing on one leg. Um, so they, they are building a lot of balance, um, core strength, um, posture work is, is definitely challenged throughout, um, improves motor skills. So you can see here, these kitties are working with balls. We work with hula hoops, balls, um, uh, teddy bears, bands, scarves, bean bags, all kinds of things where they've got to throw it from one side to the other, throw it forward, balance it on their head while they're balancing on one leg, now add a hop. Um, so there's lots of, of fine motor skills that are being challenged right throughout. Um, They've got to turn, they've got to look down, they've got to jump forward, back, side to side, left to right, cross over, crossing their midlines. I mean, it's intricate. And we don't start all kiddies there. We start with three-year-olds with very basic music, slow-paced uh, music, basic routines. They hold on to a little support bar in the beginning, and we slowly develop them from that point and make each workout a little bit more challenging, um, where there's a couple of movements thrown in at the same time, like compound movements. Um, so they are being challenged all the time with faster pace, um, different skill sets, more balance, more technical work. Um, and so it starts slowly and they build up and they learn routines um, over time and dances and things like that, which they really enjoy. And then, of course, proprioception. I don't really need to go too much into that because Meg has really spoken um, a lot about it. Uh, but a rebound is really effective um, at improving balance and, and proprioception. Because if you think about it, they are actually standing on a surface that is off the ground. They constantly need to know where they are in relation to the ground, to things around them, to the ceiling above them, how close are they are, how close are they to the edge of that rebounder, what is happening at this time, am I going to fall off? There's a lot happening in, in the brain. And I mentioned just now before Harley distracted me, but I find that rebounding is a form of mindfulness as well. Because at that moment in time it's very hard for them to focus on anything else besides staying on that rebounder focus balance breathe music arm what's she doing what am i doing am i going to fall off where am i in relation to the floor the ceiling okay beat of the music okay holding the core all right breathe there's a lot that they're thinking about at the same time um so it is very very stimulating um but it's really um, the arousal, arousal levels couldn't be higher, I promise you, when it comes to, to doing um, a rebounding workout. Builds cognitive skills, improves concentration, um, 
uh, rebounding, it also engages all of the senses. So, you know, you're hearing the music, you're also seeing the trainer, you're seeing the screen, depending on, on where you're doing the workouts. Um, you hear, you're listening to the music, you're very aware of your body, there's touch, there's proprioception, um, everything. Probably the only one is, is smell, <laughs> unless we put some nice aroma, doTERRA oils in, in a nice diffuser inside the room. That's probably the only one that they're not um, really um, using too much as the sense of smell, but pretty much all the other senses are being engaged at the same time. And then building right. confidence sure. and self-esteem is also um, uh, another one because we work in a lot of groups a lot of the time and we start very slowly and we start with a, a very basic song and we build onto that. So every time that they come back to that basic song, we add more moves, we make it a little bit more um, complicated so they, they, they know that they pick uh, sort of pick up from last week now we're going to add we're going to add so when they get the moves right uh, it's like learning a dance routine they it builds confidence it builds their self-esteem because they're getting it right and they remember it from the last time and you're kind of layering a cake each time so each time they're feeling like they're getting somewhere and they're getting better and that's really cool like we see kids that start off with very very low muscle tone and very poor balance and after a couple of weeks they are just they're able to balance on one leg they they're keeping in time with the music they're not falling off it's really quite amazing. It's amazing, okay. Lisa. It really is super. You know, I, I think that the, I think people are going to be absolutely fascinated to, to look at joining it. Um, and I'd love for us to maybe loop around to what we've got on offer for everybody for this week. Um, okay. So, um, you know what, Lise, won't you make me host again? And then what we can do is we can just show people we've got and then we'll swing back to you to be cool. able to do the final draw. Should we do that? No problem. So um, I, must I show the, um, the competition winner and that's that thing yet, Meg, or not? Can I show this? I think this we should keep, I think we should keep, we, you, can, you can do the competition winner because I think we haven't got much time for questions. You know what I think we should do, Lise, is okay. maybe just, yeah, draw the competition and then I'll okay. answer a couple of questions. Cool. Okay, perfect. Um, whoop, let me just move past here. Can I show this quickly, Meg? It's like 45 seconds or so. Okay, yeah, we haven't got too much time for questions. Okay, cool. Okay, I'll skip past that. It's all good. Whoop, there you go. And there. Okay, so this is the draw. So let's... And the go go back to what it was. Yes, tell us what Oh, okay, is. so what it was. Okay, there we go. So you're going to be winning. I mean, Meg, some of this is all from you. Um, so maybe you want to mention the, the stuff yeah. that you're giving away. So we've, we've actually got some amazing things from PlaySense here. Um, and the we, we, we've got our PlaySense apron as well as our PlaySense little CD with all the music on it. Um, there is also, I'm just trying to have a look at all the writing on here, um, a PlaySense, oh, I can't read it, Lise. It's too small on, on your screen there. I have oh, got okay. A cool. list here. Okay, so we've got a PlaySense um, art, bib, and dinosaur stomp uh, CD. We got an uh, in-home placement fee from PlaySense, activity kits um, for Play-Doh, um, Playbox, so Playbox campaign, and we've got a ticket to an upcoming PlaySense paid event. So that is all from your side. And from our side, we've Dang. got a case, uh, which is the Kitties Fitbit. We've got um, a rebounder, a Bounty Kids rainbow rebounder, not just a normal rebounder. Um, a Bounty Kids Journey download, so um, I can go back one side and just show you what those are, and then some Bounty socks. So those are your non-slip uh, rebounding socks, which are really cool. And we have one winner. We did the draw earlier today, so that it will be already done uh, by the time we got here. So make should I do it? <laughs> and yes. Drum roll. The winner is. Ooh, drum roll, please. It is. There you go, Kirsten, Kirsten. Eggers. Kirsten, are you in the audience? Raise your hand if you're in the audience. Uh, let's see. So if she's in the audience, she gets another 500. But, let, but let's see. It doesn't seem that she's in the audience. But, but okay. yeah. Cool. Excellent, Lisa. Well, thank you. Can you make me host again, please? And yes, then I can sure. just show everybody what we've got on for them for this week. Um, so, you know, I think really what, what, what PlaySense and um, uh, bounty are, are really, really wanting to do is provide you with something to do with your little ones over the course of the over the next week. Um, and so we've actually put together a week of activities for you. So, Lise, can you make me host again? Yeah, there you go. I just did okay, there. there we go. That's brilliant. Okay, so what are you all going to get? So um, we have got the. Oh, I just lost it. Wait, let me pull it back up again. There we go. 
we have got the um, PlaySense Playbox, and the Playbox is an, a completely free activity program for you and your little ones. So when you enroll, you get each of the different themes, the jungle theme, the bug theme, my town, and land dinosaurs. Um, so it's four weeks of activities for your little one, completely free of charge, along with a daily activity that one of our online teachers is going to provide. So please do sign up for that. You'll get the link tomorrow morning. And of course, in terms of bounty, they've got classes every day, which are also completely free. You do need to have a rebounder at home. So if you've got your adult rebounder, Lisa, if they've got an adult rebounder, can they do the classes? Yeah. Can they little ones do them on yes, there? Absolutely. Excellent. All right. So starting from tomorrow, we've got a teddy bear tea party with teacher Jill, um, which happens on Zoom. Um, there are story times. There's puppet show on Thursday from Di. And then every afternoon, there is also our, um, our, our bounty classes with Megan. So this really is something that is awesome. It's Both of these are completely free of charge for you. And this is just something that we really have wanted to really support parents with over this time. So there were a couple of questions, Lisa, and I just think that there were two in particular that I did want to take. Um, and the one was um, um, from a mum who's got a cerebral palsy child. And I just wanted to mention that probably the only time we don't recommend using a trampoline for little ones, and we really are careful around the type of proprioception, is if you've got a child with cerebral palsy, because bouncing does increase muscle tone. So that's the only time we don't encourage it. Almost every other child really, really does well with proprioception. So for the mummy who asked about CP answer, um, I, I, we wouldn't recommend the, the trampoline in that situation. Um, and then one of the other lovely questions we got, Lisa, was um, just with regards to um, ADHD. One of the questions was, um, what age is too early for a child to be diagnosed with ADHD? And, you know, I think when it comes to a diagnosis of ADHD, the only thing I would say to parents is before you go down the avenue of going for the, the, um, the diagnosis of something like ADHD, start with the movement, start with proprioception, because you might find that putting a whole lot of wonderful sensory information, jumping and moving in your, into your child's um, daily, we call it the sensory diet, you might end up not needing to have that diagnosis for ADD. But certainly before a child is eight years old, I really wouldn't be looking at a diagnosis of ADD. I'd be looking at what we can do in terms of sensory information to be able to deal with it. Um, Dorinda asked whether or not we can download the presentation as a reference. Yes, it'll be sent to you all tomorrow morning, definitely. Um, and um, Hilary says, um, she said, what, well, this is our last question. Lisa, this one's for you. I know not exercising can have negative effects on your body and your mental health. But can exercise have negative effects if it is overly done? So just in, in, in 30 seconds, least before we finish off, is there such a thing as too much exercise? Oh, yes, absolutely. So exercise, well, when you over-exercise, it incre increases one's infl like inflammatory response. So it, it causes something called too much um, oxidative stress and too much free radical damage. So it's very aging. It causes too much wear and tear. Um, if you are somebody that suffers from inflammation, you'd only know that if you did your DNA testing or if you're exercising and you're feeling fatigued afterwards, uh, you get headaches, you struggle to sleep, you're restless when you sleep, you're not getting results, you've got water retention in, in your in, and just underneath your skin. Um, so yes, you generally exercise should make you feel energized. Um, it should improve your health and your your immune your immune system. But if you're over exercising, it will do just the opposite. It'll make you feel swollen, tired, or drop your immune system. You won't be getting the results. Um, yeah, so this is definitely something that I've seen over and over again. That's brilliant. And Lisa, a couple of more comments just about um, rebounding. And this is from Nalene. Cool. She's an OT. She said, as an OT, I love this. It is so <laughs> beneficial to child development. And I couldn't agree more. I just really think it is, it's just is such an awesome activity. And for those of you whose little ones are doing lots of Zooms over the course of the next couple of months when we're going to be homeschooling, get them a rebounder, get them jumping. And for those of you with little ones under three years old, or under five years old, the PlaySense program, we've got an online home program that guides your little ones through developmental activities. And the combination, I think, Lisa, of the PlaySense program and the rebounding program is exactly what little ones need and what families need at this time. So uh, we do encourage you all to join our communities. So Meg, there was, a, there was two videos that I didn't get to, to play. One was a small little compilation of some of the live classes because for the rest of July, all of our live classes are totally free. Um, so I don't think we mentioned that, but it's really exciting because we do uh, two classes on a Wednesday, three on a, on a, sorry, two on a Tuesday, three on a Wednesday and three on a Thursday. Um, and all of this was in my presentation and I just took little snippets of the behind the scenes with Bella, some um, parents that have been sending in the cutest little videos, put 
put them all together um, and that was actually in the presentation and I didn't get to play it. But maybe if you do share your presentation tomorrow, you can maybe share mm. mine. Uh, Absolutely. You can actually see. And yeah. Yeah, all of these classes right up until the end of July are totally free for all parents that have a rebounder at home. That's absolutely wonderful. That's fabulous, Lisa. It really is something that all parents can use. Um, and Amy Lou said, I would love to have the info for online rebounding classes for July. So all of you who are watching, you're going to get a delicate, delicate pack tomorrow morning. It's going to give you the links to the PlaySense program. It's going to give you the links to Lisa's um, shop. You're going to be able to get a whole lot of amazing kits on her shop as well. You can buy the rebounders or do the classes for free. So watch out tomorrow. There will be an email in your inbox. And from myself at PlaySense, and from Lise, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's thank been wonderful you. to spend the time. There is a survey as we finish off. So do fill that out for us and um, we can get more information to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good night, Lisa. Thanks. Cheers. Ciao.